Hallelujah to your name. We thank you so much, Lord, for who you are, Lord. You're a glorious God, a good God, a present God. Jehovah Shammah, you are here, Lord. A healing God, a strengthening God, a counseling God, a comforting God, a sustaining God, a sanctifying God, a potter, a rock steady God, an anchor, a close God, a best friend, a royal God, a king, a tender God. As you say, suffer the children to always, always allow the children to come to me. A burden-bearing God, you tell us to cast our cares upon you. And Lord, you're a God that loves to hear from us. You're a redeeming God, a covenant-making God, and you're a God that desires fellowship. You're a listening God. And you hear the cries of your people, Lord. Lord God, we ask this morning as we speak on prayer that you would minister to us, Lord. We're going to read your text, Lord, and we confess that we do not need any commentaries. We confess, Lord, that we do not need any uh, internet uh, tools. We thank you for all of them, Lord, but the only thing we need is your Holy Ghost. And we're asking you, Lord, to electrify your word, Lord God. Your word is settled in heaven forever. Do a work in our hearts. Forgive us all of our many sins, Lord. They be many. You're such a merciful, gracious, great God. And Lord God, as you uphold all things by the word of your power, uphold your building, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord, for this confidence series. Take us deeper, Lord God. We pray for the children. We pray for every child, every soul, every teacher. We pray for all the pulpits in this region that, Lord, you would do a work in all of our hearts. Take your leaders deeper, Lord God. We thank you for all the above. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Isaiah chapter 30. Before we even go here, can we please go to Psalm 121? And yes, there's going to be a lot of scriptures today, so please let your fingers be ready. It's good to flip through the scriptures. Psalm 121. I've heard this in song. And in case you didn't know, the psalms were sung. Have you ever heard the psalms set to music? Uh, I would recommend Sherry Youngward. You're going to hear a song from her at the end of the message today. Um, She is from one of the Calvary chapels on the West Coast, but she actually sings the psalms. She puts them to music uh, and is very similar to to how, you know, they were originally um, demonstrated before the congregation. Psalm 121, it says... I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. And you have to understand that Jerusalem and the temple and the Shekinah glory of God dwelt high upon the mountain. So when they talked about, I will look up to the hills, they weren't just talking about any of the mountain ranges in Israel. They were talking about being down in the region of Jericho and looking up to the hills where the mountain is actually so high, where the clouds cover it and you don't even see the city. They're talking about looking up to where the Lord sits upon his earthly throne upon the Ark of the Covenant. I will look Look and lift up my eyes to those hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Hallelujah. He will not suffer your foot to be moved. He that keeps you will not slumber. There are times when we feel we're moving. We understand our frailty. But the word is here to remind us. He will not suffer our foot to be moved. He that keeps thee will not slumber. He's always got his eye upon us. Behold, he that keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade upon your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day. Whatever that trial is that waits for you in the day, the Lord says the sun will not smite you. And it says, nor the moon by night, whatever there is, the concerns and the fears by night. The Lord will preserve you from all evil. He will preserve your soul. The Lord will preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 30. Israel 
sang those songs. We sing those songs. Israel knew the doctrine of God's nearness. They knew the doctrine of God's gentleness. They knew the doctrine of God's closeness, of his faithfulness, the doctrine of the Lord who will never leave you or forsake you, the doctrine of God as a covenant keeper. And it says when he could swear by nothing greater, growing up, all of us have sworn by something, tried to make somebody swear by something, or listen to other people swear by something, right? So what did you swear by when you were growing up? You know, people want to get all serious, so they swear by some relative, you know, that's, you know, from wherever, you know, or they swear by this, or they swear by that, right? It says that when the Lord made his covenant, he was looking around for what he could swear by. And because he found nothing adequate enough to swear by, could he swear by the holy city of Jerusalem? Could he swear by the very Ark of the Covenant itself? Because he could find nothing adequate to swear by, when he made a covenant, Hebrews 6 says, when he could find nothing greater, he swore by himself. What does it mean that when he found nothing great enough to swear by, he said, I swear by my own character. I put my character on the line. If I break or I fail in any way, I'm no longer God. I put all of who I am on the line. Israel knew all of this. But like us with hearts that are rebellious, with hearts that are so good at remembering the things we need to forget, we're so good at remembering every offense and every detail and every part of it. The Bible says we need to forget that. But the things we need to remember, that's what we forget. You know, So we're remembering things we need to forget. And we're forgetting what we need to remember. All of us being of the same cut. Israel, knowing all of who God is. Isaiah chapter 30. A little lack of devotional life here. Or maybe you're maintaining your devotional life, but it's just become very routine and mechanical. And like last week we talked about, you've been leaving your heart out of your devotion for a long time. Remember we said that King David, does it say in the Bible that he stopped reading his Bible when he fell into adultery with Bathsheba? Does it say that anywhere? No. We can infer that he did, though. We can infer something was going wrong. Perhaps he was still reading his Bible, but he wasn't bringing his heart to it. And then when David repents, he says in Psalm 51, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. He came back to remembering, wait a minute, Lord. Yeah, I was doing all the right things before I got caught in adultery. I was in all the right places. I was giving out all the right doctrine, but I was forgetting something, that there's a sacrifice I'm to be bringing to the table. When I come to my Bible, when I come to your presence, I'm to be bringing something. It's not just about me coming any old way and what you got for me, God, and I'm just looking to take, take, take. This is a relationship. He said, Psalm 51, 17, there's a sacrifice God requires. One, he wants truth in the inward parts. Two, he requires a broken spirit. I bring him brokenness. I come to him and I bring him, Lord, here I am. Praise your name. My life is yours. Speak, Lord, for your servant heareth. I surrender to you right now. That's what we bring. So Israel... Failing in some of the above or all of the above, knowing Psalm 121, and you will see the parallel I'm setting up, because we can know Psalm 121, know that God is a present help in the time of trouble, know the story of Jericho, know the story of Goliath, know the story of the Red Sea, know the story of the sun standing still, know the story of all of the glory of God, we can still find ourselves living in Isaiah chapter 30. And I believe that as I read this today, I'm going to be reading somebody's present biography. Someone's going to have their biography read. Now, be comforted in knowing that all of us, if our lives were written out from the spiritual point, this would be a page in all of our biographies. Um, Some, perhaps every other page. Some, every other chapter. Uh, But all of us know it. Amen. Isaiah chapter 30. I first would like to begin by reading from Hosea chapter 11. Would you just write that down, please? Hosea 11, the Lord says something very warm, very beautiful. And I pray you would come to know it and come to love it. It's so, so, so beautiful, so tender. 
Are you there at Hosea 11? Go to the end of Daniel and you'll hit Hosea. Are you there, Hosea 11? Yes, you're there? All right. Hosea 11, and it says, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And I called my son out of Egypt. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam and they burned incense to graven images. He sang when Israel was a puny little nation in captivity. I loved them and I brought them out. But verse two, he sang, but so quickly they still talked the talk, but their devotion quickly went to another place. Maybe there's some here today and we all know how to talk the talk, but our devotion is in another place. Our incense, our passion, our perfumes are for another arena and not for the Lord. But look at what he says in verse 3. I taught Ephraim to go. Ephraim is another name for Israel. He's saying, not only did I call them out of captivity, I taught them how to walk. Look at this. I taught them how to go, taking them by their arms but they knew not that I healed them. He's saying, have you ever seen when a mom or or a dad takes the baby and puts their little feet, you know, the big black toddler shoes, when the toddlers got those bad boys on, you know that they're starting to walk. You ever see when a mom or dad puts their shoes on their shoes, holds the hands and walks with them this way? The Lord is saying this here. When I called my love out of Egypt, I taught them everything. I even put their feet on my feet and held their hands. I taught them how to walk. But slowly, slowly, verse 3, they knew not that I healed them. They so quickly forgot all that I did for them. Verse 4, I drew them with cords of a man. I drew them with bands of love. They fell in love with me because I hooked their hearts with lines of love and I reeled them in gently. They didn't know love. They'd been hurt in the name of love. They only knew lust. They only knew love with conditions attached. I hooked them with something called unconditional love and I reeled them in slowly. I was to them as they that take off the yoke on their jaws and I laid meat unto them. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 30. Time doesn't allow now, but I would ask you to also write down Ezekiel 16. In Ezekiel 16, there's another, another song, if you will, if I can call that a song from Hosea. In Ezekiel 16, there's another song where the Lord is saying this about Israel. He's saying, Israel, I know your parents. You're the offspring of Canaanites. And as we know, Abraham was called out of a demon-worshipping nation, right? Right? He says, I know your offspring, your, your, your offspring were Canaanites, not of me. He says, Israel, when you were born, you were dropped and left in a field. You hadn't been washed. Your umbilical cord was not cut. People walked by you and no one even pitied you when they saw you. What a picture of us before we found the Lord and as life just began to unravel for us and slowly friends began to distance themselves or relatives distanced themselves and people began to treat you with a long handled spoon because really what was going on was spiritual and they had no idea how to deal with it, nor did they have the spirit of Christ to even give Christ like compassion. So you began to feel very alone and isolated when it was really just leading to the Lord coming and taking you in. But how about us when we were just out in the field? He's saying he found Israel as a newborn out in the field, discarded, unwashed, unclean, and nobody understood and no one pitied them. The Lord said, I came upon you, Israel. Please, you got to read Ezekiel 16. Great chapter. It says, Israel, when people did that to you, I came upon you and I said, live. And that's what he said to us. Amen. He says, I picked you up. I washed the blood off. I cut the cord. I washed you in salt water. I disinfected you from all the funky stuff you had your hands wrapped up in. And I disinfected that heart of yours. I wrapped you in swaddling clothes. And I put the skirt of my cloak over you, which meant ownership. I grew you up. I blessed you. I taught you to walk. I made you strong. And now that you're so beautiful, now you want to act like you did it yourself. 
and turn your back on me. It's in this tone that Isaiah is addressing Israel in the name of the Lord. Chapter 30, woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not for me. They used to be a people that learned when I taught them to walk, I taught them to pray. I taught them. My spirit that I breathed into them led them to seek me first. They knew it was good just to pause and say, we need to seek God first. But like Ezekiel 16, slowly we get a lot of experiences. Slowly we think we've been around the mountain a few times. And perhaps we have. We've seen a few things. We've experienced many things. And then all of a sudden, now the knee-jerk reaction isn't to pray anymore. The knee-jerk reaction is to just rehearse our tremendous experiences that we've had. So now we're seeking counsel, but not from the Lord anymore. The Lord calls that rebellion. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, that take counsel, but not from me. They cover themselves with a covering. Everyone wants a covering. Everyone wants a type of a covering. Even if it's as much as someone saying, hey, you know, I'm going and I'm driving through this particular area. You know what I mean? I'm kind of lost right now. You know, I'll call you when I come out. Or, hey, I'm going in here. Or traveling nurses. You know, they'll say, I'm going into a building. You know, um, I'll call you when I come out. Everyone in every way likes a covering, right? We all desire. I can go on and on with the examples. What he's saying here to Israel is, you want a covering. But no, you're no longer concerned that that covering is my spirit. That you may add sin unto sin. The first thing we need to realize is that prayerlessness is a sin. Prayerlessness is a sin. It is the immature believer that thinks that the Christian walk is all about what you don't do. I don't watch R-rated movies. I don't do this. You know, I don't do that. I don't do this. I don't do that. You know, I, I don't commit this. They think it's all about the sins of commission. But there's another set of sins as well. And it's sins of omission. It is also a sin to see the things we ought to do, the good things that we ought to do and that we neglect from doing them. We do not want our life to be characterized by what we don't do. It's to be by what we don't do and also by what we do. Prayerlessness is a sin. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23, Samuel says to the Israelites, God forbid that I should sin in stopping to pray for you. Wow. So he says... Woe to the rebellious children. You cover yourselves with a covering, but it's not my spirit. You're seeking counsel, but you're not seeking me, so that you may add sin unto sin. Underline sin unto sin. When we're not praying, when we're not seeking the Lord first in all things, we're only setting ourselves up for the initial sin of not seeking Him, and then the following sins that just continue after that. Even if it all looks good. And then he says this, My rebellious children walk to go down into Egypt, but have not asked me at my mouth. They've not asked me what I thought about it. And what are they going to Egypt for? To strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Egypt represents the world. Going down into Egypt represents going down there for what Egypt recommends that what Egypt recommends as salvation, what Egypt recommends as how to get peace, what Egypt recommends as how to be successful, what Egypt recommends in how to get comfort, what Egypt recommends at how to find healing. All of Egypt, and believe me, Egypt is not lacking any advice or any philosophies. Barnes & Noble bookstore and every other bookstore is chock full of it. Any bookstore for that matter. And he's saying to the Israelites, one, you didn't seek me first, but you're, instead of coming to me for strength, instead of coming to trust in the shadow of my wings, you're going down into Egypt. Here's a great thing for us to ask ourselves. What are you trusting in right now? What are you trusting in right now? There was an Israelite king that God rebuked him because he trusted in the doctors and didn't trust in God. What are you trusting in right now? It doesn't necessarily have to be some thing like, oh, yeah, I'm trusting in casinos. It doesn't have to be something as, oh, casino or or, or the bar. You know what I mean? What are you trusting in right now? What of Egypt's philosophy? 
What has Egypt said to you of all? And I well, okay, I understand, you know, spirituality has its place, but, you know, da 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 da. What, what, what philosophy is Egypt giving you to cause you to trust in the shadow of Egypt? Do we need to be reminded that Christ is the solid rock and he has made clear that everything else is sinking sand? He even says in the Bible, cease ye from man. Don't even trust man. Why? Because his breath is in his nostrils. What does that mean? Cease from man whose breath is in his nostrils. What he's saying is man is not self-sufficient. His breath is in his nostrils. The Lord's saying, why trust in one that's not self-sufficient? I'm, I'm the only self-sufficient one. So he says, they're going for a covering, but it's not my spirit. They're covered up. They've got their bases covered, but it's not being covered with my spirit. They're taking counsel. They've got a strong cabinet on their side, but, but they're not asking me anything. They go down to Egypt and they're trusting in the shadow of Egypt and they're not trusting in the shadow of my wings. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt, your confusion. Would you please write down shame and confusion? When we live a life of prayerlessness, we are setting ourselves up for shame, meaning that when that house of cards reveals what it is, and when you realize, because the desire and the needs within us can only be met by the true and living God. How many of you realize you got a lot of needs? <clears throat> a lot of needs. A lot of desire and a lot of burdens. You can try to place them somewhere else but you will find no other place adequate to even sustain them, let alone receive what you need in the innermost parts of your being. Only the Lord is the solid rock. Everything else is sinking sand. Shame. And then confusion. When we begin an enterprise with the Lord, we can always go back and say, well, Lord, you know, we began on our knees. Let's recalibrate. But what about the confusion that comes when all of a sudden we don't even know if what we're doing is even of God or not? We don't even know if it's even an Isaac or an Ishmael or not. Now you're confused. You're persevering. You're down to the wire. You're running through it. You don't even know if you're supposed to even be where you are in the first place. Confusion. Shame and confusion are the sure fruits of a life of prayerlessness. For his princes were at Zoan, and his ambassadors came to Hanes. These were the two provinces in Egypt. They were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them, nor be a help or a prophet, but only a shame and a reproach. He's saying, you've sent your convoys, Israel, down to the chief cities of Egypt to get your counsel from Egypt, your comfort from Egypt. I'm the God that's made a covenant with you to always be with you and bless you and supply your needs. Now you're going to go rest in a covenant with them as though that covenant is all you need, as though that covenant is salvation, as though that covenant can withstand all of the, the tests of time. And then he says, look at the burden that you go through. Would you please write down burden when we don't live a life of prayer? We're setting ourselves up for burden. Israel was not down the hallway from Egypt. You had to travel through a desert, and that desert was called the Negev. The Negev was hot. The Negev was nasty. The Negev did not have the word mercy in it. It was an unmerciful strip of desert. And then he says, look at even the burden that you will go through. And my brothers and sisters, aren't we such strange creatures in our self-will and in our pride and in our sin that we can know that we're going the harder way? We can know we're taking the longer route around the mountain and still proceed that way and even find ourselves whistling while we work. We're insane. That's why the Bible says, put no confidence in the flesh. It's cursed. It's loco. Crucify it and only walk in the spirit of Christ that has been breathed into you. He says, look at the burden of the beasts of the south. 
It's such a burden. You're loading up your beasts. You decide now that you want to go rest in Egypt. You want to get comfort like Egyptians get comfort. You want to have tangibles like Egyptians have. You want to have all of what Egypt has. You want to rest in what Egypt has. You want to op- operate on a different economy than the economy of waiting upon me. Even though my track record is spotless, you want a different economy. But look at the burden you go through for that different economy. Here I am, the Lord, waiting right here. And this is what you choose instead, the burden of the beasts of the south into the land of trouble and anguish from whence come the young and the old lion. There's lions there. And yes, there were lions in that region. Please don't think that just where you see lions today, that that's all of where they were. There were many creatures everywhere. I'm sure there were also grizzly bears and brown bears here too. But you have to understand, as civilization expands, wild animals are killed and driven away. So at this time, there were lions in that region between Israel and Africa. He says there's lions there. There's even vipers and the fiery flying serpent. You're like, wait a minute, I'm a zoologist. I never heard of that one. All it means is a venomous snake that leaps. It's one that curls and leaps and it's venomous. And it says, they carry their riches upon their shoulders of their young donkeys. They take all their treasures upon the bunches of the camels to a people that won't profit them. Where are we taking our resources, our treasures? Where are we laying them up is the question. What is dear to us, the best of our passions, the best of our abilities, the best of our creativities, the best of everything, are we taking it all down to try to barter something from, from, from Egypt built on sinking sand? What costs we will go through to try to buy from Egypt, one which won't work, and two which only the Lord provides, and the Lord gives it for free. Isn't that something? Who would go into a restaurant and they say, no, listen, if you sit over here, it's whatever you want, a la carte, and it's all free. Who would say, well, you know what? I'd rather sit over there where I smell the burnt food, you know what I mean, and, 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 and pay, you know what I mean? And, I don't, and, and we're just strange like that, you know what I mean? And that's exactly what's going on here. We have the Lord right here who says, I will supply, I will give all of your supply. I will always be with you. I will withhold no good thing from you. I will fill your hearts with joy and I will rejoice over you with singing. And they say, we're going to travel to where we can get away from the sound of that singing. We're going to be lured by the sound of music coming from Egypt. And we're going to take the best of all we have down there to purchase that. Verse 7, for the Egyptians will help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this. And God cries. Yes, we saw Jesus weep at the tomb of Lazarus. But God cries. He cries out for his people to hear truth. How many times growing up, you know, have you had to say, well, you know, you know, teacher yelled at me or so-and-so yelled at me or you don't have to yell at me. And then that, that adult figure had to say, well, you know something, that's the only way you listen, right? Anyone been told that? Or that's only us who grew up in North Jersey. You know what I mean? <laughs> the Lord cries. He cries for us to hear this. And when as Isaiah was delivering this, I imagine he cried. He says, you're going through all of this Israel and I'm crying the same truth. Your strength, look at this. Your strength is not to go to Egypt. Your strength is not to run to to where the world says strength is. Your strength is not found in the new bestseller in the self-help section. Your strength is found in one place because strength only comes from one place. Your strength is to sit still. And Isaiah chapter 40, please mark that down. Read the last four verses. It says, even the young man will eventually grow weary. I won't ask for anyone to stand up right now. Plus, that person would get inflated with pride if I did. But who's here right now? And you know that when you lay down on the bench, you know, you know you got to put a couple extra plates on than what normal guys are putting on. And when it's time to do the combine, nobody wants to see you in those 40 yards because you learn them a thing or two. Who's in here right now and you know God has blessed you athletically and you know that if it's, if it's showtime and if we have an Antioch Olympics, it's not a question of if you're taking a medal home, it's a question of how many medals you're taking home. You know who you are because you've already thought that thought. The Bible says this about you. 
Olympian. The Bible says that even you will eventually get weary and crumble. Even the epitome, even the working definition of strength will eventually crumble. But those that wait upon the Lord, those that wait upon the Lord. What does it mean to wait? It means to wait. What does it feel like when you wait? Well, the Hebrew word there, is, it's, it's a word that says your insides are twisting. Because you see, when I'm sitting down and I'm waiting on God, my flesh is going haywire. You know, it's like, okay, you know, who, well, who texts me? Well, all right, no one texts me. All right, well, I need to turn this off anyway. Whew, all right, well, we're going, oh man, that Pico Bill. And all right, you know, all right, Lord, here I am. You know, and you just, and you're battling all that. It, sometimes it takes like 10 minutes just for your heart to settle. Sometimes I need to go into the woods for a walk. And when I go for that walk, I literally feel like a fugitive fleeing the busyness of this life. I feel like I need to just disappear like a fugitive. Some days it's walking. It's just like, okay, you know, another walk on, you know, routine walk, routine walk. Then some days it's like, okay, I'll be right back. And you're walking and it's the same calm walk. But in your mind, you're like, I literally feel like I am escaping, you know, the matrix of busyness. But it says, when you wait upon the Lord, maybe for you, it's early in the morning with a nice warm cup of tea or maybe just some good tap water. You know, when you're sitting in front of God's word and you're just waiting for him to speak to you. But it says those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. The Hebrew word for renew is when you take something inferior and replace it with something superior. So I come to the Lord with just dental floss already fraying. And it says, he gives me back rope. I come to the Lord with rope. He gives me back shark rope. I come to the Lord with shark rope. He gives me back a steel cable. It says, when you wait on God, he will renew your strength. You will run and not grow weary. You will walk and not be faint. You will mount up with wings as eagles. One thing about eagles, eagles are the only birds that can fly so high that they can soar above a storm. And the Lord is saying that he can give us. Egypt can't give us that. Egypt can give you uh, a recommendation on where to get a pedicure. Nothing wrong with a pedicure. Recommendation on where to get a manicure. Recommendation on all different things. And there's nothing wrong with these things. Just do them with Jesus. And you walk with the Lord. The Lord will minister. That's between you and him. You know? but, but the world cannot give you advice on how to, how to, how to go above a storm. How to, how to coast above a storm with joy and with singing. They've often said that anyone can call a good situation good, but only a born-again Christian can call a bad situation good. Because we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and for them that are called according to His purpose. Our strength is to sit still. Our strength is to sit still. This is a promise. This is a promise. Isaiah 40 is a promise. Those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. That is a promise. Do we believe that? Is our confidence in that? Do we believe that? I didn't ask you how many tapestries in your living room have that embroidered. I didn't ask you how many pictures of eagles there are in your house. I didn't ask you how many pillows you have with it, how many blankets and afghans you have with it, how many magnets on your refrigerator. Do we believe that when we wait upon God, the supernatural happens beyond what we could ever imagine? But if we believe it so much, then why do we do it so little? You've just heard it shared that there's a problem with the roof of the church. And we're talking a major job, right? Well, let's just say that it was known that if you came here between 8 and 8.30 on a Sunday morning and you got down on this altar and prayed and had your hands on that altar, for every 15 minutes you spent there, $5,000 would miraculously appear in Antioch's account. And you knew that. And God said that. God said, the church 
that has prayer between 8 and 8.30 with saints at the altar, boom, 5,000 every person. How many people would be in here next Sunday between 8 and 8.30? Just because you love your church home, would be in here between 8 and 8.30 with their hands on that altar and then coming out saying, I love my church, praise God, hallelujah. How many would do that? How many? I don't, I don't think it'd be empty. But can I tell you something? If my Bible is speaking and if I'm getting this thing correctly... The Lord says that when we pray, he will do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. So what stops us from coming in in the morning and laying down on this altar and asking God to provide a blessing when everything under heaven is his? Do we really believe this stuff? Do we really believe this stuff? Do we really believe that Jesus says if two or more can touch and agree on anything on earth, it will be done in heaven? Do we believe when Jesus says, ask and it shall be given that your joy may be full? Do we believe this? Do we believe this? Verse eight. Now go write it before them in a table. Note it in a book. Well, obviously we're reading the book of Isaiah. So Isaiah obeyed that, right? So write it so that it can be for the time to come forever and ever. The Lord says, Isaiah, write this down so believers can read it for for, for millennia to come. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and say to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, but give us smooth things, prophesied deceits and that's the day we're living in you have congregation saying don't give us convicting truth give us just light humorous antidotes that just feel real good where we can bring all of our friends and no one gets offended or pricked that's what they were saying now do i believe that that's what this church struggles with my answer is no this is what i believe we have to watch out for let's go to ezekiel 33 Ezekiel 33, starting at verse 30. He says, Ezekiel 33 at verse 30, also son of man, speaking to Ezekiel, the children of your people are talking about you by the walls and in the doors of the houses. And they speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, hey, come on, I pray, come hear the word of the Lord. He's saying, Ezekiel, they're talking about you. They love your speaking and they're telling people, come hear some good speaking. And verse 31, they come unto you like people normally come. They sit before you the way my people normally sit and they hear your words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth, they show much love. Oh, they love the doctrine, their mouth says, but their heart is going after their own individual covetousnesses. And lo, you're like a song to them. You're like a pleasant voice to them, Ezekiel. Don't get it twisted. They love the doctrine. They love hearing you. They love inviting people out. They say you're like someone, you're like an instrument when you're preaching. For they hear your words, but they do them not. So you have two groups of today, three groups really. We have those that hear the word of God, tremble at the word of God, and cry out and say, Lord, I'm a weak man, I'm a weak woman. But I know that by your spirit, I can do this. I need your Holy Spirit to do this. I need your Holy Spirit to run and to obey. Then you have those that say, hey, don't give us anything convicting. We want church to be light. We want it to be fun. And we want it to end at the same time every Sunday so that we can get to our favorite restaurant and have our same seat and order our same dessert item, you know. And then you have others that confuse knowing with doing, which is the leaven of the Pharisees saying, oh, man. That was awesome. That was deep. Mm, mm. And doing all the right things, but not doing them. My brothers and sisters, we'll find ourselves in all three places at different times of our walk. But the word of God comes. And what does it say in Ecclesiastes? The word of God is like a goad. Do you know what a goad is? A goad is used to deal with an ox. Do you know how much an ox weighs? Yeah? You ever try and go ox tipping, like they say cow tipping, ox tipping, even if you can get near enough to the ox, you know what I mean? You're not moving an ox, okay? I don't care who you are and what you do. But there is this little instrument, and it's sharpened at the tip, 
And if you just poke that ox right in the ham, that ox gets to moving. We're that ox. Our hearts are that ox. People can try to say all they want all day. We can get real set in our ways, can't we? But then the Word of God comes along and just boink. And all of a sudden you're moving. That's what this is doing today. This is a goad to move us and to move our perspective from whatever we've been resting in, whether it's ourselves and Egypt and Egypt's philosophy and self-help and all these things we can do. Then we put in the name of Jesus on it and want to close it in prayer. And then that's somehow the end justifies the means, right? How many things do we launch into on our own? Didn't pray in the beginning, didn't seek spiritual counsel, moving strictly by emotion, you know, or whatever there is, you know, launching your own Ishmael, whatever. And then, then all of a sudden, now you want to hold hands and you want to pray and ask God to bless it and throw Jesus name on. And then all of a sudden it makes, it's supposed to work backwards, you know, uh, and, and, and retroactively make the whole thing spiritual. God is definitely merciful. But that is not. And there are often times where he does bless the whole thing backwards. But that is not the prescribed way. That is not the way that gives him the most glory. So, verse 15. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and in rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. But you still wouldn't want to hear it. Verse 16, but you said, no, we will flee upon horses. Therefore, you will flee and we will ride upon the swift. Therefore, they that will pursue you will be swift. Can you write this down too? the Lord picked you? The Lord saved you for fellowship. Okay, now there are some in this room. You have had great earthly fellowship. So for you to now be saved, you're just transitioning over into having great fellowship with the triune God. For some of you, you've not known healthy fellowship throughout your life. Both of us, in whichever group you find yourself, you need to know the Lord has saved us to teach us fellowship, perfect fellowship, agape, sweet prayer. He teaches us this. But oftentimes we want to run. You know, there are people in this room that are scared to get alone with God. But do you know that God understands that? Do you know that God saw that before he even picked you? Have you read Psalm 139 lately? It's kind of like, okay, well, you know, you want to read a Bible verse? You got to go. You want to read a Bible verse? You know, anybody? And oh man, then, then you try to find an app on your phone that at least talks to you, talks Bible to you. So you feel like someone's with you, even if it's, you know, uh, the robot on the iPhone, you know, you're just afraid to get alone with God. So what do we do? We flee on horses. What are your horses? What are the places you try to run when God is calling you? When God is calling you to come clean and to come honest, where do you run? Perhaps you run to the phone and you just call a million people and then you call that prayer, right? Perhaps you just run and bury yourself in busyness. What are the horses you run on? But the Lord loves you so much, he, he, he will not let you settle for, for defeated Christian living in prayer. So what does he do? He'll allow you to feel your fears. He will allow you to feel your fears, not to break you down, but he is just trying to hedge you in from running to every resource that provides no living water. He says, so 1,000 will flee at the rebuke of one. One thing that we find when we are not living in prayer is we will be plagued with fears. And this day definitely has enough of them, doesn't it? Plagued with fears. 1,000 will flee at the rebuke of one. At the rebuke of five will you flee till you be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain as an ensign on a hill. And look at this. I love this. So we hear this message today. And some of you are sitting here and you're saying, well, you know what? I've been living. I've been living Isaiah 30 so long. I don't even know where God is when it comes to intimacy anymore. This is where he is. Look at verse 18. Therefore, will the Lord wait? Where is he? He's he's right there. Someone's always said, if you feel far from God, it's not God that walked away. It's you that walked away. He will wait and wait what? That he may be gracious unto you 
and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord God is a God of judgment. Blessed are they that wait for him. Do you remember when Moses, an ex-murderer, really believed that he had received grace? Because the Lord said to him, you found grace in my sight. Things change when we really believe that we're the recipients of grace. Do you truly believe that you've received grace? Yes, you know that you're saved from hell. You know that you're going to heaven. Do you believe that you've received grace? And not only grace, but the kind of grace the Bible talks about is John chapter 1 grace. It's grace that's always knocked out the box by the next wave of grace, which is always knocked out the box by the next wave of grace. That's what it means in John chapter 1 when it says, of his fullness we've all received and grace for grace. It's grace. Just when you thought grace was amazing, in comes a new supply of grace with, you know, big foot tires and just rides right on top of that truck of grace and crunches it. Bigger grace. Then here comes a bigger truck with big foot tires as big as a building, crunching that one with a trailer load of grace. Grace upon grace. Do you really believe that you've received grace? There be many that don't want to pray, don't want to ask the Lord. And, you know, you get all legalistic because you really don't believe the grace that there is for you. Do you really believe in that grace? Moses was told, you found grace in my sight. So what did this ex-murderer do? This man had blood on his hands and he buried the body. It's not like he killed the man and then ran, you know, and turned himself in. Killed the man, buried the body. He's an ex-murderer, spent 40 years in exile. The Lord said, you found grace in my sight. Know what? He decided he was going to believe it. Would you write this down? What happens when we decide we're going to believe that we're the recipients of grace? As I was sharing last week with someone, how many miracles have we missed Because we just doubted that God was good. There was an open door to pray for a miracle, an open door to pray for a blessing, an open door to walk through. And we hesitated because we held back and we didn't say it with our mouth, but our hesitation said a thousand words. We did not really believe. We're not fully persuaded that God is as good as he says he is. Think of how many blessings we've missed. Because we have failed to believe that God is good. Well, I tell you what, Moses decided he was going to believe God. And maybe there's some here today, and not maybe, there are. There's some here today, you need to make up your mind to believe God. That he's good and that he's gracious. And you will find how much your vocabulary will change in your prayer closet. When you really believe it. As opposed to praying the kind of prayers we've talked about, which are doubting Thomas prayers. And then we throw a thy will be done on the end to really kind of try to spiritualize the fact that we were double minded through that entire prayer. Will he do it? Will he not? Is he good? I don't know. Does he love me? I don't know. Moses decided he was going to believe that God was gracious. And you know what he did? He asked for the big one. This ex-murderer, he no longer was looking at his past because he realized now that God wasn't looking at his past. This ex-murderer decided he was going to go for the big one. What did he do? He said, God, show me your glory. I'll show me the, I want to see the full blast. I want to see the vavoom of, of the universe. I want you to lift the hood. I want all the horsepowers of glory revving in my face. I want it all. <clears throat> And what did the Lord say to him? The Lord said, you can't see me in that clay package full blast and live. In your glorified body, yes. But in your clay, your clayness cannot handle me full, full, full revved up. But I tell you what I'll do. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. I'm going to cover your face. And as I pass by, I will then remove my hand so that you can see my back parts. What it means in the Hebrew is so you can see my wake. I'm going to let you see my wake when I go by. And just like you could tell the size of a boat that's just gone by when you're out at the water by how big the wake is, I'm just going to let you see my wake. And what did that wake look like when it went by? And he said, I'm going to proclaim my name to you. And as he passed by, he revealed his glory. So know what it was when God lifted the hood and God floored it? What were those horsepowers about? It said, the Lord 
the Lord is good, gracious, merciful, long-suffering. I forgive sinners. That was his vavum when God popped the hood because Moses decided that because of his position, he had the right to ask for that. Do you believe that you have the right to ask for these things? Do you really believe grace? And verse 18 says, the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. Oh yeah, you're running this way and you don't want to seek him and you're running tired. And Egypt, that trip to Egypt is sure taking a toll on your body. It's sure taking a toll on your finances. Where's God? He's waiting. He's waiting to be gracious to you. He loves us so much. We don't have time today. Would you please write down Luke chapter 11 and I pray that you would go and read this. The disciples came and they said to him, Lord, Lord, teach us to pray. Luke is the gospel where you see more about Jesus's prayer life than in any other gospel. All of the gospels tell us that he was baptized in the Jordan River and the Holy Spirit came upon him in the form of a dove. Luke is the only gospel that says as he was praying, the Holy Spirit came down upon him. Other Gospels tell us that he went up to the top of a mountain and then he became transfigured and shone like the bright sun. But only Luke tells us that he was praying as that happened. As he was praying in the garden of Gethsemane, great drops of blood came. And then obviously here they see Jesus praying. And isn't it interesting that Jesus, fully God, fully man, as God, he came to show us the heart of God and to teach us the doctrine and the prayer of God. But as Jesus, the man, he came to show us what a prayer life looked like. During times of popularity, when people wanted to swarm him and get around, you know, he ran and he prayed. Times when they wanted to exalt him and it wasn't the right way and people's hearts weren't right, he ran away and prayed. He arose up a great while before a day and he prayed. And if Jesus, the spotless lamb of God, could not imagine a day without praying, how much more so us? How much more so us? Please read Luke 11. And I love this. We'll close at verse 20 and 21. Start at verse 19 even. For the people will dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You will weep no more. He will be very gracious unto you at the voice of your cry. The Lord is waiting to hear the voice of your cry. When is the last time he's heard the voice of your cry? Not a pharisaical prayer when you're busy praying and thanking God that you're not like other people. And a prayer where you're basically honking your own horn. Not a prayer like the Pharisees where you're praying large, eloquent prayers so people could say how spiritual you are. He's talking about a cry. You see, there's a difference between my praying and my prayer. When I get up here and I speak in front of you guys, that's my praying It is a prayer that is going to be doctrinally sound. It will be a prayer that by God's grace and leading that you can amen and chime in with. And and we can all speak as, as one unto the Lord. That's my praying. But my prayer, you don't get to hear that. My wife doesn't get to hear that often. That's between me and my Lord. That's my prayer. It says Peter denied Jesus three times. He went out and wept. Somebody has rightly said that if people heard, most likely, if they heard what Peter prayed during that moment on his face, no pulpit in the country would ever invite him to be a guest speaker. That's our prayer. That's when the deepest part of us cries out to the deepest part of him. That's when we really unload and we release all the toxic chambers and we go straight to our healer and the lover of our soul and we rejoice in the blood of Christ and we just slowly just know that living water is entering into places that we had cut off and we're being made yet more and more into his image and likeness and you truly feel yourself mounting up with strength and you truly feel your wings mounting up like those of an eagle. It says the Lord will wait for you to cry. Don't get too busy to cry. Don't get too busy to cry out to God. Some people say, oh yeah, I I, I pray to God in the car. Well, hey, there's nothing wrong with praying to God in the car. I pray to God on the treadmill. There's nothing wrong with that. I pray to God in the steam room at my gym. There's nothing wrong with all of that. Nothing wrong. Just remember this. That's not the ideal place. 
So you hear what I said? There's nothing wrong with that. God will meet you there. You can get revelation in your car, doing laundry, in your steam room, on your treadmill, walking your dog, or picking up behind your dog. But just don't settle to say that that's the ideal place to cry out to God. If he blesses you there, amen. But there's something that cannot replace getting alone with the Lord, getting on your knees and getting prostrate before God. And if you're in the woods, hey, you don't got to get on the ground. Deer ticks are real. You know what I'm saying? But your heart can get on the ground and you cry unto God. And I will tell you what, you will not, you get your journal out and you start marking stuff down. You will not cry unto God and find the Lord not answer and glorify himself before you fast enough to give you spiritual whiplash. So someone says, well, my prayers haven't been answered in a long time. Well, how are you praying? It says he will not despise. He will not despise the broken. Maybe you're coming to him like you got it all together. Maybe you're coming to him like the rich young ruler. He will not despise the cry of the broken. Wherever you are, you understand you're one cry away from personal revival. Maybe today, maybe this is the day. Amen. I tell you what, I'd like to play one song. Let's kill the lights. We're still going to have our doctrine classes right afterwards. Okay. If you can enlarge this, please. Let's take some time right now. Please hold on. And and, and brothers, please make sure the volume is good. Can we get these lights on the side? As this song plays, my brothers and sisters, let's just do what the Lord is waiting for us to do. I love that. He says, I'll wait. He'll wait. I'll wait so I can be gracious. Amen. Amen. You click it for it to go off. Hold on. Okay, and lastly, hold on one second, please. I think, is it this guy? The lights up here? Maybe it's this. Don't mind us playing musical lights. There it is. My brothers and sisters, let's take some time now and let's adore. Let's adore our God. Amen? Amen. 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 Lead me beside
And I will live with them forever. And I will have no money. The Lord is my shepherd. He is my God. And I will. Jesus said, which of you, if you have a son and ask for an egg, which of you would give him a scorpion? Which of you, if your son asked you for some bread, which of you would give him a venomous snake? He said, if you being evil know how to even give good gifts, how much more will your heavenly father give you good things? And then he says, and even give you the Holy Spirit when you ask for it. So let's ask for God's spirit right now. One of the names of the Holy Spirit is the spirit of prayer. You know, let's ask for a fresh filling. Father, we ask for a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we love you. And we want to do things your way to give you glory. And Lord, your prayer, Lord, is our breath, Lord, in this pilgrimage, Lord. And we've been trying to find false substitutes for respiration, Lord. We want to come back to breathing prayer, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God.